Can I just mention that oh. the program is coming to us this evening in compliments of the Southbridge Cultural Council and we are indebted to them for their support and ongoing uh, encouragement to the Jake Edwards Library. I really uh, look forward to coming back. Southbridge is like my second hometown, so I, uh, I love coming back and coming back to this library, and either for the fact that I spent a lot of time here in my youth or the fact that I'm being brought in today to talk about one aspect of the trade or another. And uh, tonight's subject is uh, teapots and coffee pots and the history um, dating back well, 3,600 years plus. It's not a program about drinking tea or drinking coffee per se. It's about the utensils and the wonderful uh, similarities and differences on how people have uh, taken part of these drinks as well as the utensils and how they use them in, in order to enjoy coffee or tea. Um, The earliest mention of tea, use of tea leaves, as I said, can go back 3,600 years, or 3,000 years, I should say. And it really initially was an herb for spicing your soup before it became a popular drink in the Tang Dynasty is around 1000 AD. And the idea of making tea at that point was by just whisk, pouring hot water into a bowl. And I'm just throwing a simple bowl right now, certainly bigger than some teacups. Whisking hot water and tea together as a drink. It would be another uh, several hundred years in the Song Dynasty before the teapot would come into use. So drinking tea out of a bowl, and in the Chinese and uh, Japanese customs, the bowls are thicker in the winter and thinner in the summer. in the attempt to keep the uh, contents, allowing them to cool or to uh, stay warm longer. But the influence on tea drinking, uh, on the form of the teapots and such, actually can date back about 4,000 years. Uh, in, at the earliest, not from China, but to the coffee drinkers in the Arabic countries. I'm pull it. Let me get another one to play. Yeah, I'll be fine. So I'm going to pull a handle right now. The next vessel I'm going to make as an age around 4,000 years old. It is from Azerbaijan. And like most early containers for making tea, it would have been a vessel for pouring hot water. Onto some kind of herb. So this actually probably in Azerbaijan even predates the drinking of coffee, but you'll see one of the earliest forms known for the type of vessels that we call coffee pots and teapots. But it's unconventional because it is not familiar, a familiar form that you're going to see although nowadays it's called a samovar. Certainly didn't have that name back then, which means to heat within. <coughs> so it's also 
that T-bowl was made of one lump of clay and made one wall. In this case, I'm going to start off by making a, a tube requiring the use of a shish kebab skewer or a poo poo platter stick to help me bring this to the size and thinness that I want. So I'm making two pots right now out of one lump of clay. And the second difference of, is that where most of the pots I'll be making have a bottom in the center. This one is hollow at the center, reaching down to the metal in the wheel head. And it's also a two wall pot. So this is Islamic pot from Azerbaijan with the Russian name. Dating back 4,000 years would eventually find itself in the 18th century being duplicated in England because it was a unique pot that was quite popular with people who enjoy drinking tea. So the form, even though it's old, is going to come back to us. Thank you. And again, this is called a samovar. Scrape the water off. Now, just above the base, I should place a hole. And I'm going to stretch this out now a little bit more. And we'll, we'll cut, the, cut this out. The tube's hollow, so it would go right against the hole here. The tube would lace up all around the top come off like this. Handle goes here. Put that. And this is a basically a hot water pot. It would be Because of its unique form, it would be filled from the bottom, upside down. The water will rise up. It would come out through the hole here. And because my spout is above the level of the water, it locks the water in. Which is the way you should be buying teapots anyway. You never buy a spout that's below the water level. Because that's water finds its own level and then it's just going to come out the spout. So this samovar teapot or coffee or water pot, I should say, because it can be used to make both those drinks, would be copied even in China and Japan and other Asian countries at some point. So the double wall is an insulation? No. You put the coals in the tube, the heat rises and warms the water inside, 
So you're actually eating it faster than a regular flat base pot because it's got the tube on the inside, which is what a samovar, um, a metal samovar, the Russian T1, they have a cold chamber in the center. And um, it heats the water in, in that way. But if you put this on the fire, as well as with the coals inside, it's certainly going to heat the pot water faster than, than any other vessel. So, 4,000 years, spouted pot, handled pot, very simple in appearance. We're going to look at coffee and tea, both are at that time starting to be enjoyed as drinks uh, or as flavorings. And like I said, with, with coffee, becoming popular in 850 AD and tea becoming popular around 960 AD they both uh, emerge um, and in making them there are going to be certain styles of pottery that will emerge. And the styles largely come out of the Arab countries, initially as coffee pots, and then influencing Asian potters one way or another. So I'll pull another handle. And this is a technique which I'm using on the potter's wheel. The clay is slippery. If I didn't apply water to it, it'd be sticky. And that's what the word clay means is sticky. And um, I'm applying pressure, and that's stretching the clay out. So it's pressure and it's motion that causes the clay to transform into hopefully what you're looking for. different places and they're forms that are what we consider to be acceptable today without any thought. Okay, so let's just get this first. So I'm going to do a little bowl on top. If you have questions, just ask. <laughs> I always find watching people grow just almost meditative. Well, thank you for the compliment. If I was stressing you out now, I'd be worried. Take that off. So 
But I'm also showing some different ways of lifting the pot or doing a pull as we call it. So there are several ways to throw the pot. And uh, the word throw actually means to turn, to wind, or to twist. It doesn't mean to slap the clay down hard and there. It's the same meaning to throw a ball, you rotate in your shoulder. Throw a ball, throw clay, this is what you're doing. Rotating the clay. So out of the Middle East, some potter came across a gourd and said that would make a nice shape on the potter's wheel. I think is neat. His ideas of all around us, and it's just a matter of getting confident that it's not a stupid idea, but a good idea. So this is called a gourd pot. And this is one of the early pots that will go up into the Asian countries and be copied as a water ewer for hot water, or a wine ewer, or a teapot. Let's pick you up a little bit. There we go. Come on, you. All right. So this form and similar forms emerged around the 16th century. Sometimes the spouts are short, sometimes the spouts are long. I cannot cut a hole into the vessel right now. Um, because I would just distort the wall. The piece is too soft. So I prefer to basically just demonstrate the techniques right now. So a long spout on it, certainly reflective of previous pot that I made. And so that curve at the top is to help keep the water in? Not the curve, the height. The height. The height. It's above water level. There we go. Oh. Come on, you. Oh, it slipped in my hands, but there we go. So that's the gourd pot, influenced by Simple vegetable. <laughs> so the possession of tea and coffee in the related areas of the world was extended into the 17th century. Oh, man. Where in the early 1600s, the Dutch were importing tea and coffee into Europe and England. And the first teapots that were emerging onto the market, well, actually the reason why tea became popular was because 
Somebody went broke. It was the king. Uh, let's see. It was. Uh, I haven't done this program in a while, so I'm a little off on my information. I think it was King John. No, King Charles. Charles II. She was a Portuguese princess, and if Charles married her, he would quickly get a lot of money and other riches into his pocket. Seemed like a good deal for him. And when she arrived from Portugal, she was confronted with the offer of, would you like a beer? And she said, I don't drink beer, I drink tea. And that's when tea became popular in England. Although coffee houses at the same time were just going up and down. By the end of the 17th century, there were 300 coffee houses alone um, in England. But the Dutch started importing these teapots. There we go. And the jury's out, quite frankly. I'll explain that in a little bit. And how one uses a little teapot like this. Because what our customs are and what's familiar to another group can be startlingly different and they're both are fine, no problems at all. And how you want to use it, and myself as the potter, I really don't care. One, two, three. That's about the right amount of clay. So that's like a balloon right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Simple tool.
got a few noodles over there which I'd have to remove later. Just started playing with that tool. Seems like, although I like the way the ridges come out, it's not quite perfect in the And this goes over here. Oh. Now that's why I do it. <laughs> so that's the handle. That's the handle. I have seen those. Called I Ching teapots. And of course you're going to stick back it down on me because I've got a nice sticky coil. Let's see if I can burp this up. No? Okay, slowly we do this. handle that we're not used to. Yeah, of course. Works, does the job. Right, oh yeah. That's what is fun about this program is that we're so stuck in saying that this is the way it has to be. Right, and no, it no. doesn't. No, not at all. I mean, just the fact that tea wasn't even made in a pot until it was brought to England. Um, well, in China, it was made in, as a hot water and whisked in the bowl. It's a perfect tea ceremony for that and in the other Asian countries. But this also shows you you can cut the lid separately right. from one piece. Um, the spouts are made the same, the handle's different. So a bunch of, or what one historian that I recently read about said, no, you don't pour out of that spout. You draw out of it. You suck out of it. These teapots are made one or two cup in size. Right. Individual servings. Oh. Now, so there you, you just go. just drink directly. It's, yeah. I, because... Uh, yeah, I mean, that could have been a be. custom at some point. I know once upon a time you slipped from your saucers, so... Yeah. Yep, and that would be to cool down the tea. Yeah. And in some case, yep. <laughs> oh, my granddad did it. That was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, as a child, I remember doing it. You know, and it was, we were appalled. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just perfect. that was what you did. Proper. I mean. The one thing, yeah. though, you know, what you're saying about the, the tea coming out of the, you know, people drinking directly from the pot, the tenon, you know, the build up of tenon and how strong the tea would be. One or two servings. Like I said, this no, is... No, but, it, you know, as it sits... As yep, you know, it gets puckery. Yeah, like I like to, you know, infuse and remove. Yeah. Just a thought. I right. think it's... A but maybe they were made of stronger stuff than they were. <laughs> I, uh... And plus, there's so many different kinds. I mean, a green tea would be different, but... Sure. I, um... The British practice, there's a pot called the posset pot, which is... Um, similar to a bowl with this, this spout coming from the bottom with two or three handles on it and you draw from the bottom using this external straw. That's because it's a warm ale, milk, um, food, drink. Right. And uh, if you don't want the curdled milk on top, you draw off from the bottom. Oh. So you see all these wonderful... Yeah. Right. Um, Posset pots, but they're all the external straws. They're not pouring spouts. So these pots, that's what's wonderful. It's just, these things screw up your head. It's like, no, it's not, the way. it's not supposed to be like that, but it is. So 
by 16, it took about 50 to 70 years for the Dutch to suddenly realize, because they're putting, the British are putting the tea into the teapot and the Spanish, that they need holes. The Chinese put one large hole in it. All the Chinese teapots are being exported to Europe. And it took until 1670 for them to be ordered with strainer holes. Okay. So then the tea starts to be made in the pot. Right. So the familiar teapots that we know of are going to start coming in after, uh, in the last quarter of the 18th century, or middle, I should say, middle and last quarter of the 18th century in England, the potteries are making teapots out of a variety of metals and clays types. Some of them, some of the clays are very, very poor, um, hard when they're fired, called porcelain, and they don't like the heat, they crack, so you always warm the teapot first before you pour the hot water into it. And some potters developed the idea of taking that tea, that, that clay, and adding uh, magnesium to it in the form of soapstone, so it's called soapstone china. And others create a translucent teapot, a type of porcelain known as bone china because it contained ox bone. And some add glass, powdered glass to the clay, so it's called soft paste porcelain. But all told, the potters or well, the teapot that is popular with most audiences is called the Brown Betty. Yeah. And no one, nothing I've read is definitive about why it's called Betty. I've been doing this for a number of years and I still can't find the research that is definitive on, was it after somebody named Elizabeth, or what's the story? But anyway, the teapots will arrive here into the American colonies. And we go through the first war with Britain in 1776, and then we go through a second war with Britain in 1812, and in doing so, there's a huge embargo against British goods. So the American potters and glassmakers and tinsmiths go to town trying to meet the American demand for the table. And we make our own version of the Brown Betty. The one I'm making here is will be quite similar to one that was being made in Waitley, Massachusetts in the 1820s that was being shipped up and down the East Coast. There are pottery shops from Maryland north out uh, and going west to Troy, New York that made their variations of a black or a brown teapot Of course, as tea becomes more available, the teapots are going to, and at a better price, tea, teapots are just going to get larger and larger. There we go. We got that. That's the first cut. And let's see. So we got the bowl.
goes like that. Thomas Crafts, who was making these, they had a company in Whaley, Mass. that was making these in the 1820s. Had numerous children, of which his daughter was a trained potter by the mid 19th century. In the 1820s, down in Baltimore. There was a pottery shop operated by a woman. So it wasn't a male dominated trade, but women are, don't get me wrong, women are also not that common either, but there were those that knew the trade. Magnificently reflective black glaze. And an imitation, perhaps, of what was known as Jackfield ware in England. Why a black glaze teapot was actually more of interest to some people than a white porcelain teapot or even a soft paste porcelain is because tea stains and you won't find that tea stain in a black glaze pot. But unfortunately what's going to happen is they're going to make peace, not, not, not that it's unfortunate to make peace, but they're going to make peace with England. And for the years during the war there was an abundance of production in England, that looks right, that was warehoused. So as soon as we made peace, stuff was shipped out of here one, to, to America from England at one third the cost that they would have charged before the war. And potters go out of business and have great debt and everything else. And the teapots are not being made anymore because people want to buy the white pottery for the table again, including the white teapots. There we go. So we'll bend this spout, pull it like a handle. Put that down. Originally the spout would have been shaped in a mold where the clay was placed into it. Oh, come on. Where the clay was placed into it, uh, like you're putting pie crust in a tin. And then you press the two halves together and the clay will stick together and then you have your, your spout. about the leaves as to, you know, was there any way of holding them back? Were there strainers inbuilt at any stage or was it always understood that um, you'd use this, some sort of a strainer external to the pot? Well, the, the, the original imported um, Chinese teapots had one solid hole, one big hole, not solid, but one one large hole. And in 1670, the Dutch realized they needed strainer holes. So that's when that was introduced. 
And when it comes to these Whiteley teapots, it's always seven holes. Occasionally you find a nine hole, but the ones that are known are generally seven hole. There we go. And that takes off from, so this should have seven holes poked into the side. Taken from there. Yeah, it's certainly true. I've never made pottery on the potter's wheel, and I never will in my life. Because this is just simply a shaped material, uh, what some have called the first synthetic material. Because what we did with the first bricks was we actually made rock. And that transformation is only by heating the product and causing it to melt at a certain point. So with my... Um, my clay, if you looking at it as if it is a glass, um, it's going to have different melting points depending on how much melter is in the clay. And when you look at different clays, um, as if they're a body, and although clay body means something different, I have a mixture of clays here. That's why it's called a clay body. It's not like I went down to Alpine Drive and dug some clay out of the brickyard down there and, and used it immediately, or down in Woodstock, Connecticut. I'm using a clay body. But if you look at clay as if it's a body where the, the main component that makes it glassy is sand, um, being the skin of the material, and having its, low, uh, its melting point lowered because Sand's melting point is around 2,800 degrees, sometimes higher, by simple things like calcium, sodium, lithium, potassium, uh, things found in the apparent rock that Mother Nature brought to a powder that, and then deposited this material. The more uh, of those materials that you have, the lower the, the, the glass will melt by the heat of the kiln or the oven that it's using. So that would be the blood part. You got the skin, that's the silica. You got the blood, that's the uh, flux. You need the bones, and that's going to be alumina. And in the case of a pure clay, uh, no pure clay, a clean clay that's white, having very little flux, and a lot of bone and a lot of skin, you can get a translucent white glass when you bring the clay up in a kiln heat where it's glowing a white color, approaching 2,600 degrees, either a little lower, maybe quite higher. There's porcelains that go over 3,000 degrees now. Um, as the clay, that white clay, moves in the ground because of water or wind or glacial action and it gets contaminated with more flux, it's going to um, have a lower melting point where you're confronted by a, a piece that's quite opaque that you can't see through, which is what we term as pottery, not porcelain, although porcelain is a kind of pottery. Um, and this opaque clay may perhaps have a tan color from a little bit of iron in it, or it might be a, a nice cream or a white color. And it's brought to anywhere from a strong yellow heat to a white heat in the kiln, somewhere around 2,500 degrees, 2,300 degrees. And it's very hard and stone-like, so it's called stoneware. And then there are these other clays that are highly contaminated, that have a ton of flux in them, and iron mixed in, so they're not a cream color or a yellow color. They're going to turn a red color, just like my clay will do. 
um, when the clay will rust in the heat of the kiln as the oxygen is being brought into the kiln by the fire it's going to um, turn the, the, the iron into a rust color and you can always tell when you're walking by in Southbridge here how hot the bricks are fired um, in these buildings because this is all Southbridge clay on Main Street if you're looking at a very dark dark brick chocolate colored then it really took a lot of heat in the kiln it was by the firebox because and the iron turned black in color if it was cooler in the kiln then the iron would be red because the, uh, the fire wasn't taking oxygen away from it um, during the firing to turn it into a black iron it retained its red color and it would be a deep deep um, almost mahogany in some cases as you can see but if you go inside the buildings and you go look on the foundation walls the interior walls you're going to find some orangey bricks and you're going to find some pinkish bricks what we call salmon bricks and those were a distance away from the fire they didn't get as hard as those closest to the fire so they're more porous they're more susceptible to brick rot especially if they're of an orange color and um, those are fired at a lower temperature somewhere not at orange heat which is what I'm looking at a bright orange in the kiln but perhaps a red orange heat or even a red heat which the red heat is attainable in a pit firing uh, such a, or a bonfire such as the Native Americans were utilizing to fire their pottery in the area but because it's a smoky fire their pottery doesn't turn as red it generally takes off into a tan or a, a cream color simply because it's just a smoky atmosphere that the pots are, are fired in um, so earthenware is what this product would be called because it's more earth-like more friable Stoneware when it's hotter, and the stoneware clays are found on Martha's Vineyard and down in Berlin, Connecticut, and Long Island, New York. So there are some other clay pits too that are found in the Northeast. Um, there's some white clays, there's some clays in Charlton that were used as paint pigments there, and, uh, and in Oxford. Um, there's a variety of clays that were mined that were used for different purposes as well um, in Massachusetts. So these are earthenware. For a pottery like mine, whoops, with a pottery like mine, I would need to have a kiln to get it to the highest temperatures, which is a, a brick constructed or a stone constructed, or simply looks like a pizza oven. Um, and it's got a chimney in the back and a firebox in the front, and it's made out of domed clay and you can fire your pots in there to an orange sheet. It doesn't have to be too complicated. <coughs> so that's when it's pottery, when it comes out of the kiln. On the wheel, it's nothing but greenware, and it retains its soil similarities, and it gets wet, and turns to mud. <laughs> Any other questions? So I'm going to finish off with the last pot, and especially this time of year, the last, some potters were hired to do um, throw in piece work. They would have to throw a certain weight of clay every day, and they would get paid accordingly. And by the time the end of the day comes, which could have been a 10 hour day, 12 hour day, or more, depending on the season, um, Uh, the potters would rush to finish off their day by throwing the last piece and that would be called the cobbler. A uh, cobbler is not a trade, it's not a term, uh, uh, it's not a, a, um, a flattering term, it's a quality of work. So when you make a whole bunch of pies and you roll out crusts and you get to the last pie plate and you only have one crust and not two. You cover <laughs> your filling with the top crust. That's the cobbler because nobody knows there's no bottom crust until you cut into it. It looks like all the other pies. 
So you cobbled it together. So this would be the cobbler. There. In the Middle Ages, this stuff was called slub, S-L-U-B, maybe it was pronounced S-L-O-B. Teapot. It's as far as I'm going to go in telling you what I'm making. And it's going to utilize the bowl and the bottle <coughs> form. So I'm not doing anything different. But like, there's a wonderful diversity of form. within different cultures and how even a similar form can be used differently by one group of people than another. They have different demands on it. That is certainly the same with this. What I'm making is a teapot. What you think I'm making along the way is exactly what you see. But let's see how it all goes together because it's in looking at the differences. You could look at it and you could say to me, I know what you're making and I could agree with you, but you'd still be wrong. What you see is your personal experience. And when you share that with me, maybe I'm going to see something differently and you teach me something. People have been sharing and drink for thousands of years and hopefully the celebrations will never end but the experience of sharing is what's important keep the whole community whole so we got a narrow bottle there and no opening If you have any more questions as I finish this up, I'm more than happy to answer them. So we got one enclosed teapot spout. Oh, it was a little bottle, depending on how you want to look at it. seems like there are a lot of pieces to this. This is a teapot. Or, let's see. There. 
The idea to make this actually came from a seventh grader back in the 1980s at Mary Wells. Because I, at the time, wasn't as proficient. So, and I was familiar with making cups and bowls and pitchers, and I was boring the seventh graders. So I asked for suggestions, and the kid in the back row shot this out. So, totally intimidated. I realized that if I looked upon the problem as little pieces, and then realized that those little pieces were very familiar to me, because I was making them for something else, I put them all together, and then after I made it, I realized I could make it into a teapot. So, it's taking a crazy idea, finding out that it is possible. First one of these I made was rough, of course. Did it satisfy the kid? Yeah. yeah. At that point, they were screaming out, make Bart Simpson, so I had to make Bart Simpson. <laughs> I, had to, I was doing all these crazy things. And in fact, the kid came back the following year, and I taught him on the potter's wheel. Nice. Yeah, it's funny how it works out, because sometimes you meet somebody and it's the sarcasm that you hear in their voice actually turns into a friendship later on. Right. That's what happened then. There we go. All right, so made five little bottles. They're very much like teapot spouts. Take that off. Just about up to time, which is good. Wipe the slob from my hands. And let's put this teapot together. So first, as with every pot I've shown you, everything is not finished until you get to that point where you say it's finished. And some pots were made out of multiple pieces, some We're thrown with two walls. Nobody ever said you had to keep your repeat the pot you're making flat on its base. You can turn the pot around and make the base anywhere you want. So there's the handle. And then we take the ruffled bowl rim and we can do this. Take the stick, put the eyeballs there, put nostrils 
see, and this is a hollow bottle. So I can And I could open up yeah. to the inside and make a, a wider opening, certainly later. Good evening. The library will close in half an hour. The computer will be turned off in 15 minutes. But you're using a computer and that can be the handle, and I can put an opening back here to fill it up with maybe make it a teapot or any other kind of wine container or whatever. Oh, how fun. So, concepts are never completed. They're always ev evolving. And I think it's through conversation that the evolution of ideas is rewarding. So, I thank you for sharing tonight's uh, program with me. And uh, I hope you can attend uh, next year's program. Thank, thank you. you.